He is the founder of Hashim Sarkis Studios with offices both in Boston and Beirut. Dr. Sarkis has now been appointed as curator of the 17th International Exhibitions of La Binali Architectura 2020. Dr. Sarkis is no stranger to the Binali, as he was a member of the international jury of the Binali 2016, and previously participated with his firm in the pavilion of the United States in 2014, as well as that of Albania 2010. Dr. Sarkis is currently the Dean of School of Architecture and Planning at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT, in Boston. Previously, he was the Aga Khan Professor of Landscape Architecture and Urbanism at Harvard University. The theme of the upcoming Binali is a question. How can we live together? It seeks what Dr. Serkis has referred to as a new spa spatial concept in which architects imagine spaces where we can generously and cordially live together. Tonight's conversation continues this concept entitled with another question. What if Dr. Ha uh, Dr. Hashim will be reflecting through his own works the role that architecture can play? I should like to pose a third question. What if everyone in the audience turned off their mobile phones without being prompted, and Dr. Hashim can begin his talk. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Hashim Sarkis. Shukran, Ustaz Badr. Shukran to all of you, to all of you. I assume I have to speak in English. I speak in English. My visit to Kuwait is my first, and it is I have to say long, long overdue. It's 54 years overdue. When I was a child, my father would come to Kuwait on business trips and would come back with boxes of tamar and stories about warm and friendly people. And when I was also a child, uh, some of his friends would come to Lebanon and we would hang out with their kids and play together. And actually, I remember very well a young kid my age, uh, whose father was my father's friend, and we were playing with the matchboxes on our terrace, and uh, I gave him a Lamborghini Miura, purple color, matchbox car, and he brought it with him to Kuwait with the idea that I would come and visit him to get the car back. It was a kind of agreement between us. So I never made it to Kuwait until today. But if you know a man my age, by the name of Ahmed, can you please ask him for my Lamborghini Miura? <laughs> Since then, I've moved to the United States and had the luck of having Kuwaiti classmates and colleagues, uh, Kuwaiti students, many of whom are here tonight, and then through the Kuwait Fund in my office, having Kuwaiti interns and giving me uh, very rich perspective of architecture education here in Kuwait and the breadth of intelligence and generosity of mind that uh, you have. I've also had the fortune of meeting Mrs. Hossa Sabah, uh, who has gratefully agreed to be on the visiting committee of the School of Architecture at MIT where, with her help, we're imagining the future of architecture education for generations to come and setting for ourselves goals. But I think through Mr. Sabah's help, we have had 
the fortune of bringing it to a certain level of cultural specificity and cultural sensitivity. So, Mr. Sabah, thank you very much for all of that. But, <laughs> but my trip was finally accomplished by an invitation from her, and who could say no to Mrs. Sabah? Uh, overdue, but I finally made it. So thank you very, very much for honoring me with uh, the opportunity of standing in front of this podium, about which I've learned so much from colleagues, especially from his historians of Islamic architecture, who feel it's, uh, it's like Christmas when they come here. I also was asked by Mrs. Sabah to speak about both my work and the Biennale. And it really gave me the opportunity for the first time to bring the two together. I've always thought of them as separate tracks. And even though I can't talk much about the Biennale until March, that's Venetian rules, I will spend most of the time talking about my work, but I found a few places to link them. For one, if one's architectural practice is dealing with the realities of clients, programs, budgets, sites, constraints, the Biennale would present itself as being the opposite. Free-spirited architectural ideas thrown around, uh, thinking about the future without much of these constraints. But ultimately, it made me think the other way around, that actually practice architecture at its most aspire, at its most aspiration sorry, uh, has that potential to ask the same question. What if things can be otherwise? And in a way, every architectural building aspires to meet all of those constraints, all of those contingencies of place, budget, etc. But to say, what if life can be a bit better thanks to the architecture? What if people gathering in the space can feel a little bit better because of the architecture? And it's that notion of architecture's ability to posit the question, what if, not just to solve problems, but to inspire possibilities, that I think is common between the two tracks. There's another dimension that I feel is common between the two and has to do with a disposition that I would like to share with you regarding the role that an artist, and I would also add an architect, could play in society. Let me confess in front of all of you that I'm a romantic through and through. A romantic in the sense that I believe in the power of the individual imagination to transform the world, that our selves are infinite and the world is finite. But I also believe that this individual imagination is not incompatible with the collective imagination, that the individual imaginations can work together to change the world together. And through this this position I discovered John Keats, the 19th century English poet whose, not just his poetry, but his reflections on literature and poetry inspired me a lot, particularly this letter that he wrote to his brothers in which he coined a famous, even though cryptic, notion of negative capability. In this, he reflects on the fact that artists have this negative capability. For that, he says, he means when man is capable of being in uncertainties, mysteries, doubts, without any irritable reaching about after facts and reason. Many have tried to interpret and decipher what this means. The notion of negative capability is not negative in the negative sense. Uh, Keats had studied medicine before, and negative positive was something about magnets. The negative being the thing that takes in, and the positive that gives out. And for him, the negative capability of artists is their ability to ask what if things can be otherwise without necessarily understanding every aspect of the world. We can, thanks to the nature of our disciplines and our crafts, posit alternatives. And these can be inspiring of change rather than dictating change or guiding it. And it is this freedom that Keats has posited as being the agency of the artist. And with that, I would like to begin presenting to you a series of projects uh, around that possibility of us being able to imagine things otherwise, first through my work and then 
through a very brief description of the BNI. Let me preface with this other little obsession that I have. This device called the cyanometer, which is a circular device invented in the 19th century by geographers like Alexander von Humboldt, and would use it in their travels to measure the blue of the sky. Alexander von Humboldt, the famous German expeditionist, geographer, philosopher, would carry it with him in his expeditions, particularly in Latin America. And every time he would visit a location, he would document it very, very carefully. It's flora, it's fauna. And he was very famous for developing a section of mountains to put in them all the strata of the earth. And through that very careful documentation, he would specify what is unique about a place. But then he would carry this cyanometer against the sky, and he would measure the specific blue that the sky has in that particular location. I've always been fascinated by this notion that as much as you want to document every aspect of a place, the blue becomes also another aspect of the place that marks its specificity. But that the cyanometer presents a kind of scope, uh, a range of possible blues that the sky in its universality might have. I've also been fascinated by the possibility that architecture could play that role. To be at once of the place, measurable, specific, contingent upon the qualities of the culture and the place, but able to take you up, to become one kind of swatch of blue within a universal collective sky. That it could fluctuate between its specificity and its universality. The protagonist of today's lecture is a project that I designed for the city of Biblos, Ishbel. Uh, north of Beirut in Lebanon. It's the town hall of the project, of the city, but I will also talk about other projects in order to elucidate some of the ideas related to Biblos. Many of you have probably visited Biblos. It's the most visited his, uh, tourist site in Lebanon, partly because of its main proximity to Beirut. It is a city of about 40,000 people with a metropolitan area of about 100,000. It is known to be one of the longest continuously inhabited cities in the world, meaning one of the oldest and longest inhabit continuously inhabited cities in the world. Uh, it has been designated UNESCO uh, World Heritage Site for a long time, which has been both a blessing and a problem for the city. A blessing because it has protected it, and in a way a problem because it has protected it and forced many people to move out of the historic city and create this kind of suburban sprawl that you see over there. The city prides itself for many, many layers. Uh, this is the Phoenician layer, which has been excavated by the French mandate in the 1930s. This is a remnant of the old Ottoman bazaar. This is the old Roman axis of the city, and you can see some old Mamluk and, uh, and uh, Crusader uh, antiquities as well. And then you see the sprawl of the city as a result of all of this. This is its relationship to the sea. They've discovered the Phoenician harbor recently right here. No, sorry, I should just use this. And this image shows actually very clearly the relationship between the historic city and the suburbs, which are sporadically built and interspersed with remnants of the agricultural fields of the city. This, I think, is a banana plantation right behind the project. This is the old harbor. And to tourism has been thriving in the city uh, it's as basically being its main economic uh, activity. And they try very hard to attract uh, tourists from different countries. I like the title of this, which is typically Lebanese, mixing three languages, Hacienda de Pepe, Jardin, public, etc., and fishing, and then uh, trying to attract people from different languages, mixture of languages. There's also another dimension other than historic uh, tourism. There's the religious tourism. Many of the monuments have been embellished and made open. This is a crusader chapel with a veiled uh, Muslim woman visiting. This is the Muslim mosque with, with the uh, Roman uh, axis in it. And then 
the famous, by now very famous, Biblos uh, Music Festival, which opens every summer. And this is a famous concert that happened there uh, when the band, the Gorillas, for the first time took off their masks and sang with their real faces rather than their masks. So in a way, Biblos made history in more than one way. Uh, the city has prepped itself up to receive more tourists than it has been in recent past because of the regional problems and because of the economic recession. But still it has that aspiration, that idea that we're hopeful, waiting, and we're planning for more, and we're planning for better. And somehow this image captures a lot the city. It's kind of past and youthful new generation hanging out optimistic about the future of the city, playing soccer at the beach. The city has also been very lucky in having, unlike other cities in Lebanon where the elected mayor and their team, whenever they're elected, change everything about the mayor before them, they have managed to be cumulative and building up from one mayor's set of decisions to the other and creating uh, partnerships with cities around the world and because of the city's history and fame, uh, managed to attract a lot of attention and support. Uh, in this case, the mayor, who's now a member of parliament with a team of uh, the municipality, many of whom I worked with, uh, celebrating having received the best Christmas tree design for that year in Biblos. The way I got into Biblos is in 2011, uh, we won an anonymous open and black and white competition to design the Biblos Town Hall. The site was along the highway from Beirut to Tripoli, and it was in the interchange in the island of the highway, uh, an existing park hardly ever visited. And the program was to build uh, municipal offices, the administration, and the multipurpose hall. We presented the idea of three blocks that would be lining up along the highway, that you would see them very fast as if they are stones from the castle, from the sea. And the park we proposed would continue underneath, uninterrupted, so that it remains public on the ground. And that way, the activities of the municipality will engage the public even more. That's the space underneath and that's the building from outside, protecting it from sun and from noise by having the windows facing inside, dancing so that in one direction it opens to the mountain and in the other direction to the sea. The competition, sorry. No. The competition was anonymous and it was open, but it was also in black and white. We understood that to be a notion of equity afterwards, meaning some of the jury members taught in the public university, and in the public university projects are presented in black and white because colored printing was more expensive. And so in the spirit of a public open competition, they wanted it to be also equitable. And in a way, my story to you today will be about how we took the project from being a competition to being a real building and from being black and white to being colored. This is the project as it stands pretty much today. In telling you the story, I will also try to link it to the larger setting of Biblos and how a piece of architecture which sits in the middle of the highway interchange tries to connect with the larger setting and with the larger geography, and how it aspires to be at once in the place and out of the context. I will present it based on four attributes of architecture. Its connection to site, its massing as a volume, the planning, the plan as a discipline, as a way of measuring, and the facade as a way of representing and communicating to the world. In each I'll try to develop something like a cyanometrics, a way in which the architecture can be measured in its specificity and its universality. I would like to present the relationship with site 
as being that of geographics. And I leave the hyphen there on purpose because it shows the etymology of the word geography as being the writing of the surface of the earth. It's at once a way of describing it, but also a way of inscribing into it, transforming it. This is the site of Epos. You see the historic city along the water, a highway that cuts it from the connection to the mountains, and you see that there are some ravines and rivers that are continuous leading from the mountains to the city that are interrupted by this highway. And then the suburbs all around. The idea of locating the, high, the town hall along the axis of the highway was an idea of recentering the city and also of stitching between the historic center and the uh, suburbs outside. You can see graphically how the historic center restoration is actually a form of erasure of sorts and how people have been pushed out encroaching on the agricultural areas as well. Now, putting it in the center here is symbolic, but it actually takes a lot of work to make it real, in the sense that the highway is dividing, and it's a void in the middle uh, rather than a connector. You probably notice that in Kuwait as you see some of the buildings that are located in roundabouts, like one of the mosques I saw today, are meant to be places where people come together, but are actually isolated from everybody by the traffic. That was the first challenge we faced. And this is not the first time where we had to think of a project moved out of a historic city as being an exercise of recentering or reconnecting. In 1998, we designed the Housing for the Fishermen of Tyre, a project which was only finished 10 years later in 2008. And here again, a historic city that was given World Heritage Site, it became non-edificandi, you could not build in it by law. And so the fishermen who were multiplying, having children and their families growing, could not live here anymore. So the, the Greek Catholic Church gave them a piece of land in the agricultural fields outside. And uh, we were commissioned to design a project which was more of a community project in the middle of nowhere. And even though the site was to be transformed from agricultural to more speculative residential development with much smaller parcels. You can see the parcellation changing over time. We opted to make it much more collective, creating a common ground that would allow the fishermen to maintain their sense of community, and in doing that also held on to the scale of the agricultural parcels in the middle of a new residential development. Uh, today the project stands pretty much like this. Uh, haphazard speculative development with a smaller grain, certain agricultural fields, bananas and tobacco, I think, or tobacco and bananas, I forget, and then the project itself holding on to the larger scale, creating a, a definition of a larger community and a larger open space in the middle. We opted to define the outside with commerce so that it interfaces with the world. It's not a fortress, but then when you went to inside, it created something like a haven with remnants of the agricultural character inside. The same relationship with the terrain was also a problem or a challenge for us in a temporary project that we designed for downtown Beirut, it no longer exists, for a helium balloon landing. The idea here was that the developer would bring in a temporary facility, a helium balloon, where people would buy a ride, and go vertically up to about 300 meters and look over the downtown as it was being rebuilt. That, pro that type of facility was proven successful in places like Berlin during the reconstruction period after the reunification. And here it was seen that it would also help in imagining from above uh, the, the city of Beirut. That viewpoint is also a rare one in Beirut. You can only have it when you're in a military helicopter or in one of those high-rises where it's very exclusive. Here it was giving the view to the general public. Uh, it's a site that slopes nine meters diagonally, and the operations of the balloon ins required that the site remain empty. And yet the client wanted some waiting areas, a cafe, and uh, 
facilities that would allow the balloon operations. So what we opted to do was to maintain the ground, to expose its layers as a historic site, as a city of sediments, and uh, also allow the open space in the density of downtown to become a public space for people's gatherings. Here, it's being used for a birthday party in Beirut. But this notion of the writing of the surface is treated differently in other projects. In this case, a project that was never built in uh, Badimli on the Aegean coast in Turkey is a house that was inscribed, literally inscribed, as a path between the olive trees, existing olive trees, not a single olive tree would have been removed, and where by inscribing a path between them, between the arrival to the site and the sea, a house gets formed. And by the house maintaining its horizontality, as the land slopes, you'll be able to go from zero meters here to five meters here, and therefore occupy it as a line. It's almost like you're writing, and the writing itself becomes a form of inhabitation. In this particular project under construction right now, in the hills of Lebanon, we opted not to terrace the land, but to keep it sloping. It's very difficult to build while maintaining the slope, and to inscribe into the side of the mountains very geometric, pure forms, so that it's by contrast between the two that the character of the geography is heightened. And this explains a little bit how we doing that by creating a series of courtyards that anchor the building and create flight into the lower levels, but not transforming the slope. We actually had to dig up the whole surface and then refill it and reconstitute the hill. The geography is on our minds also in a symbolic way. Uh, this is from Design Week in Amman uh, two years ago, where we were asked to collaborate with local craftsmen to propose something. And we collaborated with the uh, places where the, the distributors of watermelons who generally bring the watermelons and stack them up in pyramids. And as a child, I've always been fascinated by those pyramids and wanting to go inside them. And I collaborated with a civil engineer initially to figure out how you can create a pyramid uh, out of watermelons and go inside it. But uh, the liabilities were very high. Imagine going inside and being killed by watermelons. So we decided against that and opted to create a landscape, taking the pyramidal, pyramidal form and making hills out of it, and creating seven hills of Batik uh, to kind of emulate the historical landscape of Amman, which is built on seven hills. Uh, here we worked very closely with the, with the merchants of Batik to learn from them how to stack, to figure out how when a, when a watermelon rots, you can take it out without ruining the whole thing. And we also covered it with uh, space mylar over the, during the days, which is a very high-tech material, in order to protect it from the elements. This only lasted four days, but uh, the sky mylar has now been adopted in Amman to cover the watermelons as a, as a way of keeping them cool in the summer. But perhaps the geography of this project was the one that was most engaging because we were both the architects and the landscape architects of a site that is about 20,000 meters large, uh, where we were asked to expand on an existing house in order to build four houses for a family that lives overseas. And uh, they gather here three months in the summer. And so the children grew out from this house to each have their family and own house here. And the parcel of land that they bought had been abused by several generations of users. And the topography has changed between this terrain and that. So we had to stitch them back together to make one larger landscape and one continuous topography. The existing topography right now is, or at least as we got it, shows bruises between this side and that and the slope towards the sea was very different between the two sides. So how to stitch it back together required that we created an undulation of the surface across. Uh, we used 
grasshopper and parameters to uh, regulate the landscape. And the parameters were based on giving each house their own garden, but also parameters of privacy. So that when you're by the pool, you don't see the houses. And when you're in the houses, you don't see the common pool area, which is down here. And there were also ways of using the levels and the trees in order to protect from the neighboring views. And you, other parameter was that when you're arriving from the top, the houses, even though their footprint is large, would only appear to you as these little turrets. And it's only when you see them from the sea that they all open up to the view. And that's the way we reconstituted the landscape as a series of hills. Also worked very hard in this project on the geography of the Mediterranean, or kind of recreating a stitch between the seascape and the hillscape. The famous Mediterranean historian, or rather historian of the Mediterranean, Fernand Brudel, uh, talks about the Mediterranean as being the encounter place between the palm tree and the olive tree. And here we did that literally. We covered the upper area of the site with olives that slowly dwindled as you came down, and the lower area of the site with palms that also stitched up as you went up these paths. Some of these paths were actually paths that we found on the site, traces of, that were historically there since Ottoman times. So we tried to recreate them, particularly this one becomes the main spine that works through the landscape. And we also worked with local botanists to identify trees that are very much of the region and that do not require that much irrigation. But we also relied on the Ottoman system of irrigation to uh, bring the water into the site. We discovered some connections there. And that's the site as it stands today. I think we overdue to take more pictures because the trees in this area have grown quite high. but you can see them in the way that they both, reveal, both hide and reveal the houses in a very strategic way as well. These are the olive trees, and these are the palm trees. In Biblos, back to Biblos, the geography was a very artificial one, and yet the site was very much in the roundabout, but in cast in the much larger geography of the city. The city by now have, has grown further than this, but this is the metropolitan region of Biblos. And we discovered that this history of trying to stitch it predates us by quite a while, ever since they built the highway. Michel Cochard, the French town planner who I discovered designed the museum here, uh, had tried to stitch while proposing the highway, had tried to stitch across the highway with a series of roads, which never happened. This was the city that he was working with. I mean, look at how it was before. Very, very rural suburbs and agricultural fields that surrounded the historic city. And that was the harbor back then. And this is the condition we inherited. Rather chaotic in terms of the road organization and in terms of the distribution of land uses. Slowly, as we worked with the city, we discovered that in order to bring people to the site, you needed to create bridges and connections with the transportation system and with the roads. And our task moved from being just designers of the building to site planners for the interchange. And then, understanding better the problems that they were facing, we started developing with them a transportation plan, a land use plan, a waterfront boardwalk, identifying key public spaces and sites, developing the highway frontage, entrances to the city, and town hall site planning. This notion of operating within a site which has too many figures, too much going on, and trying to make sense out of it has always preoccupied me in thinking about forms. Cities are always like that. Too many figures, and we try to make sense out of them, post-rationalize them, and, and bring them together. This uh, landscape drawing that somehow illustrates that uh, approach but thinking where every now and then you can extract a formation 
but otherwise it's an absolute disorder that has been developing over time. So one of the things that we proposed in order to reduce the congestion on the site of the arrival is to open up two other existing paths, but give them more signage, more legibility for the entrance to the city. So it diffuses the entrances. The other thing we proposed was to take an existing green road that has two underpasses under the highway and use it for public transport, but also to link together a series of parkings that are public parkings that people can park in and then move by foot to the city. We also proposed that they use a minivan that they only use over the summer year-round so that it would allow and support the parking system. We helped them with the improvement of the highway frontage because the highway till today feels like a cut into the city rather than the facade of the city, which most people see first. And then lastly, which is the project that we're working on right now, is developing a boardwalk to, con to make, I think it will be the first city in Lebanon that will have a public passage all along its beachfront to connect the different f uh, features of the city, from agricultural fields to sandy beaches to the, uh, to the uh, historic sites, and negotiate different terrains. In that sense, the site is not easy. It's, I think, about two kilometers long, uh, and we just got the uh, budget for it, and we're going to start working with them on developing it. But the challenge is the irregularity of the topography and the regularity of some of the features we're working with. And so what we try to do here is create a series of arrival points, which get marked as part of the public space system we're developing, and then trying to identify certain geometries, approximated geometries from the site. In a way, trying to extract from the geometry, from the topography, certain geometric possibilities that help organize the geography. And this is the zoom in on the site, on the boardwalk, where you can see geometric approximations of the geography that helps clarify and give legibility to the site. But we're really not imposing it on it. We're almost floating on it with boardwalks and with interventions that suggest a particular use rather than imposing it. And you can see them here distributed in terms of uh, what usages there are and what access points there are. This approach is very much inspired by geographers. Actually, a uh, 19th century French geographer, human geographer, Paul Vidal de Lablache, coined the notion of possibilism, saying that the natural environment offers us many avenues for human development, but we choose, we ourselves choose one of them as being the path we take. And this relationship with geography, between architecture and geography of possibilism, is what I would think is the approach that is consistent in many of our projects. As you see the boardwalk touching the ground, existing as a kind of buffer between the steep hill of the archaeological hill and the sea, and then elevated to create possibilities of social space when the land widens but always posited on top, even though it requires sometimes an incision or an infrastructure. Treading lightly on the earth. Now, this is happening at the larger scale, and it's yet not the building itself. The building itself has a very specific relationship to the site. It acts as a buffer between the highway and the social life here, and it allows the continuity in the other sense. In the transversal, the building is held up by a noise barrier, a thick wall that protects it from the noise of the highway, and it negotiates between the upper level and the lower level through these intermediary levels that become public spaces. In the long section, it also does the same. It takes you from a lower level to the upper level, and creating an amphitheater in between. And in that sense, it takes the inscription in the ground and its possibilities to create public spaces in the city. And here you see it in relationship to the much larger uh, 
highway, hill, old city, and sea. It's actually a very good view because it shows you the two sides. By now, chaos has creeped back to the historic site as well. Uh, I will come back to talk about the bridge and the connectedness, but uh, one thing that we're doing right now is creating a pedestrian bridge that continues the historic Roman axis and creating another connection here so that pedestrian flow can happen across with a public plaza uh, going to happen here. Let me talk about another thing that we architects spend a lot of time thinking about, which is the massing, the sculpting of the shape of the building and its size in relationship to the program inside, but also in relationship to constraints outside. In this case, the massing is a very simple one. Three boxes that correspond to three programs that were given to us in the competition. One was initially the mayor's offices and uh, municipal team's offices. Second was administration, police, uh, engineering office, uh, public utilities office. And then the third one was a multi-purpose hall, which was to be used as auditorium, event spaces, etc. And then the ground was the park, an amphitheater, a cafe which leads you to the multi-purpose hall, and on the ground itself, a lobby where you could actually pay your uh, parking ticket and certain uh, fees that you need to pay for the city municipal fees without having to go into the offices. Uh, the building massing was organized in such a way that it opened up to the sea this way and to the mountains that way. It was in the reverse until the mayor, sorry, until the mayor asked me, because his office was here, to punch a window in this block. I said to the mayor, this is a block, it's like a block from the castle, it's a big stone. You can't punch a window in a stone. And he said, but my office has to have a view to the castle to the sea, to the city. When people come visit me, that would be a problem. So luckily we discovered that if we move the mayor's office here, his office would have that majestic view, and all we had to do was reverse the angles from the competition to the building for it to work. And that's what got us to this massing. And this massing also gives you a sense that these objects, as they exist in the in the sequence of three, have at once a role of being a collective as a monument, but also a serial role. And continuing from this notion of an object that is both within a field and not, we explored a lot the idea that a certain order can emerge out of repetition. And this is a series of views of parasols at the beach without the sticks that gives you then a sense of flying saucers, but that organize themselves in certain formations depending on the geography of the coastline or the passages of the, uh, of the beach. And that idea that an object exists between itself distorting to correspond to a site or be itself, bending, tilting, repeating, is something that we borrowed, extracted the word from a French philosopher Michel Serre is a notion of the quasi-object. It's both an object that maintains its integrity and architects like their buildings to be separate, isolated, freestanding objects, but also distorts to respond. Ser talks about the soccer ball as being the epitome of the quasi-object. But his description of it is slightly different even though there's a certain overlap between his quasi-object and how we're using it. Uh, he says, a ball is not an ordinary object, for it is what it is only if a subject, a player, holds it. Over there on the ground, it is nothing. It's actually stupid. He says, the collective game doesn't need persons, people out for themselves. Let us consider the one who holds it. If he makes it move around him, he's awkward, a bad player. The ball isn't therefore the body. The exact contrary is true. The body is the object of the ball. The subject moves around the sun. Skill with the ball is recognized in the player 
who follows the ball and serves it instead of making it follow him and using it. That's what, when you're watching soccer, you call a selfish player, the one who precedes the ball rather than makes the ball appear as if it is, is preceding him. It is the subject of the body. The laws are written for it, defined relative to it, and we bend to these laws. Skill with the ball supposes a Ptolemaic revolution of which few theoreticians are capable, since they are accustomed to being subjects in the Copernican world where objects are slaves. So the idea that the architectural object becomes a quasi-object is something we aspire for and that we look at in relationship to, let's say, the character of the ball. It loses air, it's worn out, it changes in pattern, it's torn up, it becomes more of a brand, a symbol, but ultimately its main function is to lead the players, to orchestrate the crowds, to appear on television, this is in the Biblos Cafe, uh, in order to animate a conversation, and then to go inside and change in character or venue, but still animate the space. Distort, bend, change venues, but still become the piece by which it carries everything around it. And indeed, I would say most of the projects in the office aspire for that quality. Maintaining their objectness, but disappearing letting the activity around them or in them take over and distorting, bending in order to show the specificities of the site and its conditions. Perhaps the project that illustrates that the most is a project that is right now under construction, which is a very small guest arrival place, which is also a museum. We're calling it the Biodiversity House at the entrance of the Shuf Cedars in Lebanon, one of the entrances. And this entrance is a very specific one because this is where people can come, learn about the forests, and this part of the forest is mostly uh, oak, not cedar, and uh, get to meet uh, the returning ibex goats. Uh, I saw a very beautiful sculpture of an ibex from, uh, from Saudi Arabia inside the collection here. The ibex is an animal that is quite familiar with the jazeera, and they used to have them in the region, but then they, uh, they ran away. And uh, thanks to the Cedar Reserve, they're bringing them back. And they're bringing them back for many reasons. One of them is the control of fires. And I'll get to that in a second. But the site we inherited was an emergency building where uh, during fires in the area or during snowstorms, this can supply support. It has a fire engine and an ambulance here and a refuge for citizens who can hang out there for at least a week if they run out of water or electricity. And it is located at this junction here between the forest and the main road. And you can see the geography of the site, rather barren areas with terraces that are being right now slowly restored, and this is the part of the forest that is now regaining the presence of ibex. But what they suffer from the most is fires. And as they're trying to revegetate, the fires are a big threat. And the fires come because of the brush, the thistle that grows underneath, that dries out very quickly and catches fire and burns everything around it. And it also comes because of lack of accessibility. There have been a lot of terraces in the area historically, but they have been broken. And as a result, you get a terrain like this. So the ibex is being brought back in order to first, with, they want to clear up the terracing, but also to help eat the thistle to protect from the, uh, from the fires. And many of the rocks that are remaining have this amazing quality of you see them stacked up and you see the sky through them, a kind of archaeology, but that is a very much living archaeology. And much of the thistle is of this type, which is in Arabic we call it wizel. It has a very beautiful yellow blossom in the spring, and then it quickly becomes dry and thorny and dangerous for fires. But has been used historically to create huts, uh, roofs and thatches for huts. Our approach was a very simple one. We wrapped the building with a canopy to create an access platform on the roof from which you saw the forest, and a path that brought you from the entrance took you up to the roof and then back down into the forest, connecting the trail 
of the reserve with the arrival point all the way as a continuous thread. And the wrapping is literally a wrapping, meaning we add it onto the building. So the building will continue to exist as an emergency uh, support center for a while. And the museum will be the walls of the building on the outside and the rooftop, which is both a cafe and the exhibition space and the place from which you see outside. The ramp cuts between a base, which is stone, and the top, which is made out of thistle. So we will be gathering the dried thistle from the forest, stacking it into bundles, and stacking it on the roof on a metal structure to create the top. And we'll be taking the terrace stones from the forest and stacking them up at the base to create the base wall, all around a big steel frame. So that's what it will look like. You see the passage going through, cutting into the building and taking you up to the roof. This is thistle and this is the stones. The stones will be organized in sizes depending on the height. And it's essentially the building is like the goat. It takes care of the thistle and the stones simultaneously, thistle on top, building below. That's the building seen from the Ibex perspective. And this is the building at night. One thing I tried to do but haven't yet figured out is how because this thistle needs to be gathered every so often, every year, every other year, I was hoping that we can every year burn it on the structure and replace it, but it's going to be very difficult to burn it and keep the building intact. So uh, I think what is going to happen is some of it will crumble and we will be able to replace it bit by bit. So it won't be uh, as homogenous, it will be very varied in color, which I like more. Back to Biblos and its uh, quasi-object character. Obviously, the three pieces making one, looking like they're cut out of the same block, but being three, being one and serial is definitely the character of the building. But as we're trying to adapt it right now to connect literally to the site, much of its quasi-object character is emerging. The bridge has happened, and we've been asked to design a staircase and another bridge over the interchange passage to connect to the residential area up here. And so we designed the fourth block, which looks differently from different angles depending on how you see it. Uh, from here, it looks conventionally like the clock tower that we associate with town halls. There will be no clock. Uh, but it's a staircase that carries you up as a, again, a seating area for people in front of the plaza, and then you cross across. And then from the highway, flatly, it looks like another one of the blocks. But then it's actually like the, from the inside, it looks like this. And from here, it looks like the prow of a ship. The plan is another instrument that we use to organize the world as architects. And here, the plan is very much a very simple layout of an open space with everything, including the structure, pushed to the sides. Circulation, mechanical, structural are all pushed to the sides to give utmost flexibility in the layout of the building. And the plan down below is also completely open with everything pushed here to allow for the flow on the edges. This notion of trying to leave the center of the plan open and pushing everything to the side, started with a very old project, which is half built from, I'm going to say 2003, 2004, in the north of Lebanon, which is an agricultural center and school at the same time. Here we were given a program that was impossible. Expand an existing building, which had a, a dairy factory and offices, to create a culinary school and restaurant, a technical school and auditorium, an expansion of the dairy area with fruit packing activities here, and have all of this coexist at the same time. We did a lot of programming diagrams, we did a lot of studies of how these different functions can coexist, but we figured out later on that the best way to go about it is to create open spaces that buffer between these different activities at different scales, 
a kind of series of courtyards that are infinitely overlapping, and allowing the program, the specificity of program to be pushed to the edges so that if you need the space, you can spill out from here or from here or from here, depending on size and time, and allowing the social spaces to become the place where the different activities and groups can gather. Uh, the building was not fully finished, but it still has uh, some of the activities. This is one of the open spaces used by the daycare. That one had to be exclusive. It could not be shared. But from then, from the successes and failures of this project, we learned to hold on to certain parameters in the plan and allow the others to be interpreted by the users. Uh, in this case, what we also held on to was the horizontality of the building and taking you above in the social spaces especially, the tree height, and this is an olive grove down here, so that you can look over the whole field towards Mount Lebanon. So again, holding on to the geography as being an organizing principle of the space. This strategy developed into an approach that I think has become more recurring than not in the different projects, including Biblos, which has to do with creating a very intense edge and an open space open for possibilities. This is a drawing that I don't know how to describe it, but saying, if, you know when you're trying to draw a square with a free hand, you take a pencil and you draw it. It doesn't look good, you draw it again, you draw it again. And it's in the overlap of those different almost squares that you end up with a square. But that intensity of the edge is what defines different possibilities of a square without honing in on one. And I've always thought of that as being a quality that architecture could embody in giving different possibilities of definition, but not fixing one, prescribing one as being the one. And that we carried in the balloon as a first strategy, where we, both in section and in plan, pushed all of the activities to the sides, but left the, enter the space in the middle free. You see, it's, even though it's a very big project, it's actually a very small building. That is at the edge only, and the rest is completely open. And that we also did in a very literal way at different scales in the housing in Amshi, the beach houses in Amshi, where each of the houses had this idea of an edge that is dense and an interior that is left open. We did it at different levels in the way that it was inscribed into the ground. You see the slope of the hill around this frame, and the frame has different thicknesses to respond to different needs. But the frame also does many things. It has the mechanical in it. It has the circulation for service in it. It has the insulation in it. And it has all the services for the house inside it. And importantly, it allows you to have the open space completely free from structure. So you can have it open altogether. And that logic we carried into the towers themselves, where the edges of the towers are thick in this case to have the staircase in this and to and the bathrooms here, but to also protect from the morning and uh, day sun. You see the plan. This is for the stair that takes you from the lower terrace to the upper side, following the topography. This is for storage of the deck furniture. These are the bathrooms. And this is a passage which we created to insulate the house from the land humidity, but also to create an air temperature that is less than the one outside, from which we drew air for the air conditioning of the house. So it saves a lot on air conditioning uh, bills, or electricity bills because of that, and on the air conditioning system. You see the tower layout, and where the bedroom is completely open, and everything is pushed to the side. We also lifted the floor to create uh, ventilation underneath so that you can walk barefoot with no problem in the summer. You see the section of the staircase. The, the staircase acts as a chimney for hot air, and you have these openings that let the hot air go up. You see the circulation here. The idea of carving into the thickness continues into the detail of the railing, which is carved into the wall. 
And you see the towers that are completely solid on these sides with the openings, not as openings, but as protrusions, whether for the doorway or for these, which are the, this is actually the bathroom sink and the window into the sink. The story of the sink is a, is a interesting one because we wanted the bathrooms to be very thin. And so we realized that the sink was sticking out too much into the space. We decided to push the sink out and in pushing it out, it created this niche where the light comes in from the side so people can't see you from outside, but the mirror reflects the view from the other side. Uh, this notion of thickening or using the thickness to put everything in it, we also use for the air conditioning. Here we used uh, a cooling system, which is called the, dry, the gravity wall system, and it relies on pulling water from the sea, from low in the sea, so it's colder. A coil uses the seawater to cool natural water, and then that water is taken into a very thin sheet, like a radiator, that goes behind the closets and the bookshelves in the house. So the hot air comes in naturally by gravity from top, gets chilled and comes out from below. And it's been integrated again into the thicknesses of the walls of the house. The towers also follow that same logic of being completely intense on the edges, but then opening up, even in the window system. This is the courtyard inside. You can see the bookshelf operating with the gravity wall system. And every house has a courtyard, and every courtyard has a lemon tree so that they can take the lemons for their salads. And that notion of carving into the thickness is taken into the niches of the house and the common spaces where we carve, create seating areas or areas for the kitchen shelving, and each has a different stone, colored stone that we use in it. Uh, the bedrooms are in the towers and the shutters open, the glass opens, and the bedroom becomes actually a balcony completely with the railing inside it. So it's this notion of the open spaces com becoming completely open in this direction. And that happens also at the level of the swimming pool area where the edges are where everything happens and the space is completely open with a shutter system and you can see it here in the stone. Again, the use of the blue color in, the, in this area with the blue, I forget the name of the stone, but it's a Brazilian stone. And here we were trying to decide whether the veins should be vertical or horizontal, like the sea. But then when someone mentioned like the sea, I decided they should be vertical because no matter how close it is to the sea, you can never imitate the sea. You give it its sanctity, so we made them vertical. And that's the area of the sea. The common house, which is next to the pool, is also acting as a frame to kind of create a card through which much of the activity happens. You can see it here as well. This approach probably is best illustrated in most graphically illustrated in this project, which was a competition we entered for a daily mosque in Doha, which we didn't win, but where you can see, and it's very plausible in the mosque uh, architecture to do that, all of the ablution courts, the arrival area is the place where you leave your shoes on the edge, and then the prayer area towards the mahrab uh, inside as being the open space. And we took that to a kind of sculptural level where this is treated much more geometrically, but this part, the prayer area, is hollowed out and we created a series of scoops, like when you scoop with ice cream, to reflect the kind of multiplicity of domes within one space, within one dome. Again, the, the different possibilities of a circle that never becomes a circle, but is ultimately approximated out of the multiplicity. This building we also carved the openings are cuts uh, in the block of the building, whether at the base or on the top. And at the corners, two of the corners, where it's more facing public spaces, we cut it very, very close to the corner so that a minaret shape 
is created but within the block itself, reflecting a, a modesty of prayer, especially in a daily mosque. And that's the interior. We even took it to a much larger scale, and I think it works at this scale as well. This is an academy that is on hold right now because it's in the outskirts of Damascus, built for the Aga Khan Foundation, where here we tried to put the educational programs at different scales in this organization of courtyards with series of them for the living areas and the larger frame for the academic areas, but nested inside each other, creating a larger protection for the site, and then internally a nested scales of enclosure. And in Biblos, I think it works the same. A series of edges on the outside, but again, a calibration of that in section where much of the place itself is very open with many things pushed to the ex exteriors with possibilities of usage here. I would say that this space is still underused because they're in the process of building the plaza on top and the garden on this side, but it does carry with it promises of that possibilities as well. How does one treat a program as an architect without imposing too much, without being rigid, but also anticipating future changes is something we struggle with all the time. Buildings suffer from the possibility of their transformation over time, where the architecture gets into a kind of conflict with its users. It becomes an antagonistic relationship rather than one of possibilities, where the architecture inspires possibilities. This is why I focus a lot on thinking of this architecture as a sheltering sky rather than a kind of sequestering of, of spaces. And a kind of elucidation of that came from Paulo Mendes da Rocha, the Brazilian architect, when I was talking to him about how there was something very beautiful about the houses he designed because they were always a little bit too big in relationship to the activity they were in, almost like a creating a space between architecture and life. And he told me that architecture is the art of delineating the space of life's unpredictabilities. Imprevisible is the Portuguese word, which is more beautiful than unpredictability. But I think of this as being another cyanometrics of architecture, another way of measuring the possibilities without it being too specific, at being once very much into defining what spaces, what needs are, but hovering above them a little bit to allow other possibilities to happen. Finally, let me go through the last but extremely important dimension that we as architects invest in a lot. The facade, the surface of the building and how through its materiality, through its composition, it communicates. And in this case, I would like to talk about two attributes of it, color and materiality. On the color side, if you remember, the competition of Biblos was in black and white. And we presented it like this with a kind of blown up Photoshop of existing sandstones. You can never find a sandstone this big uh, for the competition, just a suggestive way. And then when we won the competition, the city said, you have to build it like this. Sandstone is the official stone of the city. You have to build it in sandstone. But because we couldn't find sandstone like this, we thought, okay, what is it that we can bring back to the surface that reminds of sandstone, we can apply to it, coloring, etc., but not sandstone. As kids, we always applied color onto surfaces. In this very simple approach to coloring, especially when the subject doesn't have a color specificity, you can put any color combination and it's believable. This is the parents. And that approach we had used in uh, the housing for the fishermen as well. There it was supposed to be a beautiful white building, uh, you know, pure, modernist, etc. And uh, the contractor came to me one day and said, Hashim, we have no money anymore for the finish you had in mind. And because white, whether it's paint or uh, uh, grain, uh, requires a very even surface behind it, we, the surfaces that we had built, used before, the water, uh, was not finished well enough to take on a white paint coat. So we thought color, and we asked the contractor, okay, can we use any color? He said, yeah, colors all cost the same. And we wanted to use color to hide the mistakes. 
And every time I now see a college building, I know that somebody is like me is trying to hide a mistake. Uh, in this case, we try to group pieces of the building in a way that doesn't correspond to the surfaces. And we also went back to color theories from Goethe to Le Corbusier and others. And in this very beautiful passage from Le Corbusier about the color blue, there's a, a feature again that brings back the, the notion of color, the, the role that blue plays in the cyanometer, but also in how we think about it in our architecture. Uh, Le Corbusier talks about blue as being a very prevalent color in life. Indeed, blue, especially this blue, uh, bleu outremer, uh, ultramarine blue, has been associated with modernity a lot because uh, it's seen as the color of space, the color of optimism, the color of the United Nations, by the way. And this very blue here is a painted blue. It's not my screen being blank, but just associate this with how much you see this blue. Every time you turn on your computer, by default, it is almost that blue. So this blue has become a very prevalent one, but for Le Corbusier, it had a very important feature, which is not unlike the blue of von Humboldt. It is at once a color which doesn't belong to nature or materials. It's the most artificial of colors, but it's a color when you put it on a surface recedes. It falls away. It creates a space to allow other things to be foregrounded in front of it. So that fluctuation of blue between being at once the material itself and being the background is something that we try to use in the architecture as well. In this case, in the housing for the fishermen of uh, Pyr, we painted the exteriors blues and we used a kind of symphonic approach. We didn't color the units nor the whole facade, but groupings. And the interiors warmer colors that bled at the corners between inside and out. We use this blue also in many other occasions. This is in the Shenzhen Pavilion where we wanted it to be a very freestanding object along a, row, a, a path of many other buildings, but we also wanted it to recede. So we lifted it, gave it a very pure geometric shape, but we painted it blue as a way of being out, being aligned but withdrawn at the same time. But there's another approach to coloring which is a very important one that we ultimately wanted to adopt, which is to take from the material itself certain suggestions and apply the color not from outside, but suggestively from inside. And this is a technique that they use in coloring photographs. We know pretty much that Lincoln's face had this kind of color, but the rest is pretty much approximated, especially the fact that we know that Lincoln was not sepia like that, but the 19th century photograph is always in sepia. So it's a kind of technique of making it look uh, of, the, of the era, of the moment. We use this in a branch library in Beirut, which was never built, where we, the, the library was supposed to have a collection about the sea. Uh, the idea was that we would pigment the cement with sand to bring back the sea, and the blue of the windows would be grafted into it uh, in order to have that relationship between the two, of sea and sand. Uh, a kind of an organic pattern, almost like a Mark Rothko in the background, with a geometric pattern almost like the Frank Stella superimposed on top of each other. We also use the similar techniques in the balloon, where in this particular case, we used this, the actual color of the earth and mixed it with the, with the cement. And then we used the cement to color the wood, kind of interchangeability between materials and coloration. We thought, we went back to the city and said, okay, can we use these techniques to create panels that are very big, that look like sandstone? And they said, absolutely not. We are already in the process of covering all the buildings along the main axis of the city, imposing with sandstone. We're not going to be the ones that break the rule we're imposing. The, and the material has been used differently in different places, here in a kind of rusticated way in an old building, so we're saying you can use it in all of these different ways. Here it's been exposed in the old churches, uh, showing it in its raw form, even though it was never meant to be that way. Sandstone actually is brittle, it rots, it uh, absorbs moisture, it becomes ugly. Uh, and, but yet they were using it ad nauseum everywhere and we could ultimately not say no. 
Uh, this is in the old souk. This is, again, one of those old buildings here in the old municipality headquarters, and here again, and here again. And actually, even though it had been adopted to be their stone, sandstone was never meant to be exposed. In the old Crusader castle, the reason it's exposed is because there was looting. Somebody stole the limestone or granite in front of it, and it was only left exposed to rot. I kept trying to get away from that until one morning there were four trucks full of sandstone dumped in front of the town hall, saying to me, Hashem, deal with it. And I had no approach to that, except that while I was in Verona trying to buy stone for another project, I met this very, very beautiful piece of yellow travertino. And I looked at it and I thought, I wish we can make sandstone behave like this, be more predictable, be more organized in terms of its color, rather than being granular and failing in, in performing over time because of the way it, it looks and behaves. But then when I went to the site, I actually saw this stacking from the site. And it occurred to me that even though the stone itself might be inconsistent in color, if you take a small shard of it, a small sample, and you look at it from the side, the color differentiation is actually much sharper. It's almost like pixelation. So we went back to the big sheet. We pixelated it. We divided it into four shades, went back to the site, identified four shades of, uh, of the sandstone, cut them into small strips. Initially, we wanted to mix some blue tile, but discovered that actually a lot of the sandstone has blue in it, so we abandoned that and kept it like this. We also took the sheet and spread it all around the whole building so that it would appear like it's one big block. So the corners would turn to make the continuity between the sides. And worked with an amazing team of stonemasons led by a Syrian refugee, Ma'allam uh, Nazmi from Aleppo. Uh, and we cut them into very small strips and then stacked them into four shades of yellow and red. And then took a drawing I have a sheet here. We broke it down into colors and numbered them and gave them to the workers. One was on a scaffold on top, one was on the ground, and they worked with color markings on the facade. And I promise you, they only made one mistake, which we had to remove the pieces and put them back. But once they got the rhythm, the whole thing was done manually with this approach of high-tech pixelation and low-tech gluing. And this is Ma'allam Nazmi in front of his art piece. So we went from this to attempts at this, and then the, finally the block itself. There's another dimension I want to talk about as a way of dealing with the communication of the architecture. It has also to do with our own impulse as architects, or compulsion, let's call it, to control every aspect of a project. There's a tendency that the architect wants to design the building, design its signage, design its furniture, design every aspect of it to control all of that, which I would call monomania. And when we won the competition, the idea was that the facade itself will carry underneath as a kind of pergola to define both the canopy for the public space and the facades as well. And that something along the lines of writing on the surface would happen. Uh, the approach we thought was something consistent with other projects, especially in terms of the writing on the surface, uh, we carried it from Biblos, where the white of the facade was, sorry, from Tyre, was supposed to be a stencil, but ultimately it became uh, a kind of uh, writing or inscription onto the entrances and onto the screens. And it became a kind of hieroglyphic on the surfaces of the facades themselves. In the balloon, the aspect of writing was written on the floor like a tarmac of an airport, here written over asphalt, uh, also in the pattern of the wood and the pattern of the concrete formwork, they are the same, where the hatching becomes a form of writing arrows inside, entrance, exit, 
uh, indicating signage. Uh, in a way, here the reference to the sea is also similar. But the idea that the surface can be written on is something that has always fascinated me about Islamic architecture and the complementarity between two forms of communication. So rather than the architecture being hegemonic and controlling every aspect of how we speak, the architecture becomes a host for the other arts, becomes a generous space where writing, graphic design, pattern making, painting, sculpture can all be brought together in an orchestrated way and architecture ceases to try to control everything but becomes a host for several voices, a generous space for others to communicate together, a surface of exchange between different media. And in Biblos, we went back to the alphabet. Obviously, Biblos, as you know very well, is the place where the first phonetic alphabet was invented. And we said, okay, we can start with a communication with the form, but then extend it to the alphabet. We said, there's the Phoenician alphabet, but there are also other alphabets, especially the barcode which had become a pattern-making system and architecture. So we wrote the word Biblos in barcode and used it as a spacing for the pergola. And so that, imagine you're driving on the highway, you would use your app and zap and it would say Biblos. And we used it to make both the facade and the pergola of the garden as well. I want to speak also to certain aspect of architecture, which is its arbitrariness. As teachers, we force our students to be consistent and to have a very rational answer to every aspect of the design that they make. That's not true. There are certain ideas, there are certain aspects that come out of nowhere that are arbitrary, and we have to create a space for that. And in this case, I was looking at the magazine at home, trying to figure out what colors I need to use, what matching patterns I can do, and I discovered this very beautiful that I forget the year, the season it was, of Dries van Noten, who's a fashion designer, Dutch, uh, uh, sorry, Belgian, very famous for his uh, color and texture matching. And every time now I fail to find the color, I go to Dries's recent collection and borrow his colors. In this case, he was using a very beautiful Prussian blue with a sandy color beige, and the textures, the shiny Persian, uh, Prussian, and the grainy uh, sandy color inspired a possibility in the Biblos barcode. So we tried a blue, a Prussian blue, and it actually worked very beautifully because as with the black, it plays this kind of, gives a thickness to the surface without it being too deep. But at the same time, it reflects the sky, even though when you see it without the sky, it looks very dense as a color. But when you put it against the sky, it, it reflects it very beautifully and it reverberates very well. Here it's with the bridges. And that's the lobby here. We use it as a background with a Venetian spatula stucco so that it becomes rough again. More mistakes to hide. And then we also brought the Phoenician alphabet and we created a mural by abstracting it and making it something like a barcode that we applied with speed on the, on the noise barrier so that it looks like the car is rushing in the background and then repeating from the original to a more abstract version of it and stenciled it on the surface of the wall. Uh, the idea was that this surface would become a surface for other artists to come and put their art on or use it as mural, but because we had to rush for the opening, we did the first one ourselves, hoping that others would come and apply their art on it. Till today, they haven't offered it to anyone yet. But we also went back to a very strict Arabic writing and imposed that on the surface as well. The signage is written with a kind of Kufic geometric interplay on the facade as well. In this sense, we think of the surface of architecture as being not just a surface of materiality that comes from inside, but a surface where certain imagery can be applied to it from the outside. In Arabic, we use the word inscription. You push and the surface pushes back. Uh, the technique of inscription is very much integral to the way we think of surfaces and of writing. And I would like to think of that the same way. Uh, French 
artist, art philosopher uh, Jacques Rancière has talked about that even in its most modernist and abstract, architecture has always, or art has always offered the surface as a surface of exchange between different science systems. Building was finished in 2016, the three blocks. We're still building more right now, the fourth block, the plaza, the new bridges, and the project of the seafront is developing. But I have to share with you that this notion of blueness, the idea that the architecture can be stepping back, can offer possibilities of other usages, does generate a level of vulnerability for the architecture. The mayor's window is still a stigma in my mind that I'm always worried that someday they will come and cut an opening, that somehow they will enclose the public space below. And you've seen it in your works as architects. Architecture is vulnerable. And if you adopt that vulnerability as a quality that you aspire for, this blueness to it, then it becomes even more vulnerable. And at Christmas, again, the city has very gaudy decorations for Christmas every year. They use the surface as a projection for very kitschy animations, and it makes your heart cringe. Uh, this, this is how they use the building. Uh, at, at the opening, I could not attend the opening of the building, but they uh, had a big concert and event outside, and they asked me to uh, send something to say. And uh, so I remembered. Ibn Zamrak, I think is his name, the Andalusian poet, minister, who wrote a poem for Alhambra when they built it. And it turns out that it's actually a tradition in Andalusian times, whenever they finish the building, uh, they would write a poem from the point of view of the building, as if it was speaking, describing its features, elevating them in the consciousness of the visitors, and also in the hope that they would pay attention to them and hopefully preserve them. So in my despair at that point, and I think it was a fight over enclosing something inside uh, about the garden and trying to fence it or something, I sent them an attempt at a poem uh, called An al -Bayt, where I tried to uh, describe the qualities of the building and saying, please don't change them. So the first one, an aduru tasri rihaban wa majala kanahrin دفدف دفعا أهلا وزوارا فحم بحاتي درجا نبتا وأشجارا they wanted to chop the trees هي لكم لا تتركوها على حال أنا الصخر ثلاث لا تقل لها بل هالا جرجرها الدهر من القلعة إلى السوق في الحارة رمل وزرقة شطآن وبحارة قل لمن أراد كسري كم تحرت زلزالا begging them please don't change it and yet I feel like architecture needs another form of support. Thankfully, this building, for protection purposes, won an award from the Union of Lebanese Architects, and now they have it in the mayor's office. We're trying to work with them to promote the city and the project, especially the master plan in many biennales. This was exhibited in the Chile 20 Biennale 2017. So hoping that these awards, these uh, visibility, Will, uh, will protect the building, will protect its blueness somehow. But there are times when I feel that architecture needs another kind of blue, this blue in order to protect it. I hope these ideas, these thoughts, as Mr. Sabah has asked me to do, uh, link the work that I've been doing in my practice with the Biennale and its theme of how will we live together. Pushing for an optimistic view and the role that architecture has in shaping possibilities for people to come together, together not just at the scale of architecture, but as individuals interacting with each other, as emerging communities at the kind of collective spaces of institutions, cities, as new households, and also as a planet that is desperately trying to live together in order to live at all. My hope is that the different countries will also adopt this theme and think outside the national boundaries, that they elevate architecture rather than use it for promotion purposes, that they cooperate rather than compete with each other, 
that they focus on solutions rather than problems. Many architects recently have been fixated on articulating problems rather than solutions, rather than saying, what if it could be otherwise? They dwell too much on defining the problem. On thinking of inclusion rather than exclusion, and on highlighting the universality of their unique experiences rather than their specificity. In that, I hope that Kuwait will join. It would be a gesture of Tadamon Arabi for a Lebanese curator to have Kuwait. It would be an honor to have you at the Biennale. So hoping that the authorities will adopt a Biennale a Pavilion project this year in Kuwait as well. Uh, I hope if that happens, to see you all in Venice in May 2020. Thank you very much.